Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Isley. I'm the director of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, and I'm really proud to welcome everyone to the endowed Dr. Michael John's lecture on healthcare policy. This is sponsored both by the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. It's really a personal privilege for me to introduce and recognize Dr. Johns. Um, he's responsible for me being here at Hopkins. He hired me back in, when he was chairman of the department. He served as the director of our department of otolaryngology head and neck surgery from 1984 until 1990. And while he was director of our department, he expanded it. He fostered interdepartment research collaborations and, and was instrumental in establishing the Center for Hearing Science, Sciences with biomedical engineering and neuroscience. And this really was a catalyst for world-renowned hearing research here at Johns Hopkins. <clears throat> He propelled the department to become a premier academic department and the top research funded department in the United States. Under his leadership, the department's training programs were expanded and due to the vitality of the uh, uh, faculty and research programs, the department competed successfully for an NIH research training grant that allowed the department to attract some of the very best trainee applicants in the country, many of whom are now academic leaders in uh, medicine. In the final four years of his directorship, Dr. Johns also served as Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs before being appointed Dean of the Medical Faculty. In this role, he led the design and constructions of the Johns Hopkins Outpatient Center, which is located next to us here. And as Dean, he elevated the School of Medicine into first place in sponsored research. He reformed the curriculum and developed innovative technology transfer programs. In 1996, he moved to Emory University, where he served as dean of the medical school, executive vice president of the Health Science Center, and also chancellor of the university. Presently at Emory, Dr. Johns is professor in the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, and is executive vice president for health affairs and CEO of Emory Healthcare Emeritus. Today, we are really very happy to welcome you back uh, to Johns Hopkins, Mike, and we welcome all of you to the lectureship honoring him. Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Paul Rothman. I'm the, the dean of the medical faculty. In China. Again, we, we have Mike's successes up here today. And it's an honor for me to introduce our John's lecturer today, Alex Gorski. Alex is the chair of the board and CEO of Johnson & Johnson. I didn't realize it's the seventh CEO of Johnson & Johnson since 1944 when it was founded. When you think of J&J, &J, it is one of the preeminent companies in the world. It is ranked um, number one in Barron's Magazine in 2016 as the world's most admired company and is currently the number one pharmaceutical company on Fortune magazine's list of the world's most respected companies. And a lot of that is due to Alex's leadership. Alex is a long-term advocate for diversity and veterans issues. He won the Ripple of Hope Award from the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Foundation. He's the highest ranked CEO on the Glassdoor Employee Choice Awards. He is really a star in the field, a leader. Uh, he serves on the board of directors of IBM in the Wharton School. He's uh, uh, got his bachelor's at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. So he is really uh, just one of the most respected leaders in the world and in this country, and it's a real pleasure to have Alex here today. Alex, thanks for coming. Well, Paul, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, and it's a real honor to be here this afternoon. Uh oh, I may have just uh, started something by setting it on here. It's already giving me my cue to end my talk. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon. No, but uh, I know on a, uh, on a Friday afternoon like today, when it's probably one of the first days when it hasn't been raining torrentially, or uh, you know we've been hiding our heads due to severe thunderstorm or tornado warnings, uh, to be in an auditorium, for you to be taking time from what I'm sure are busy schedules to be here, it's a real honor. And, in, and it's always an honor for me to be representing Johnson & Johnson. 
And it's particularly special to be here with Michael Johns, someone who uh, served on our board for many years and was really instrumental on helping lead and build our organization through a number you know, of uh, different challenges. And I can honestly say that since Mike sat on the selection committee, uh, that I had the good fortune of uh, you know, being chosen as the seventh CEO of Johnson & Johnson. I wouldn't be here were it not for him. And if you really don't like my talk this afternoon, you can blame Michael Johns uh, you know, at the same time. But no, he, I think the, the same spirit that he brought here, uh, the level of leadership, the great questions that he would always ask, and most importantly, just the, the real personal care that he always brought in, in keeping patients at the center of the conversation, no matter what issue we were talking about at the board of J&J, &J, is uh, characteristic of the impact that he's had in overall of his leadership. So, Michael, it's wonderful, again, to be with you today. Thank you. Next, look, I, I'd be remiss uh, because also in the room there's a number of Johnson & Johnson employees who I know work with you and get a chance to serve he here. And as somebody that started as a sales representative out of the Army with Johnson & Johnson more than 30 years ago, I know the challenges sometimes they face when they're far away from the corporate headquarters, but they're actually with customers, they're with patients, they're with nurses, they're with surgeons dealing with the day-to-day. Uh, that it's no small feat, and there's no way we could do what we do at J&J &J without them. I thank you as well for being here today. So thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind just joining me and welcoming them. So it's a, it's a real honor to be here to spend a few minutes this afternoon talking about health care. And look, I think it's an incredibly important topic and actually debate that we're having in our country because you... Really, can you pick up a newspaper, I should say now turn one on on your iPad, uh, where you don't see a headline, you don't see a click about health care and what it means for our country. And I can also tell you as somebody who's privileged enough to be a leader of the world's largest and most diverse health care company, it's not only if I come to Baltimore or if I go to San Francisco, Chicago, uh, or Bellevue, but it, it's when I go to Beijing, it's when I go to Barcelona, it's when I go to Rio de Janeiro, this topic of healthcare is first and foremost on everybody's mind. And I think in many ways for, for our country, it's healthy that we're having this discussion. I mean, let's think about it for a moment. Healthcare in the United States represents almost 20% of our economy. It represents about 65 million jobs, which means one out of every eight or 10 jobs in this country is directly related to healthcare as an employer. And most importantly, it's very personal to all of us. There's not a person in this room who vis-a-vis -vis themselves, a family member, a friend, isn't touched in some way by healthcare in our country at some point in their life. So I think making sure that it, as we work our way through this discussion that unfortunately oftentimes is, uh, is overcome with political rhetoric, posturing, uh, clickbait as we can call it today, taking a few minutes to have a serious discussion and exchange a healthy give and take about this important topic I think is critical for all of us. Now look, I must say as, as I look around this room uh, from this podium, you can't help but be impressed by the level of research, science, education, uh, just overall leadership that's represented by you, and, and I'm sure many of you have dedicated your careers to this field. And, and so what I say is that when I think about the overall state of healthcare in the United States today, I think the way that I might sum it up is in some ways it's the best of times, in other ways, it's the worst of times, a little Dickens-like. Now, let me start with the best, because I, I, I tend to be, I always categorize myself as a realistic optimist as a CEO. I like to have the facts, but it, I always like to try and paint, you know, hey, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is something we can get through to, but it's important that you do that in an objective, fact-based, thoughtful way. And I do believe that there's a lot of reason for optimism about our healthcare system. And I couldn't be more fortunate in my role 
looking over the, what's happening in pharmaceuticals, looking at what's happening in medical devices, looking what's happening in consumer. Every day is literally a cornucopia of new innovation, new technology, that even 10 or 15 years ago, someone in my role, it would have been hard to imagine the breakthroughs that we're seeing today. And I can remember going through the trough of our industry in the 1990s when we would frequently be criticized for advancing research that maybe wasn't truly breakthrough or differentiated, uh, that was considered me too and uh, incremental at best. And today to be able to walk in one room and be talking about T-cell redirection, talk, going into a next room to talk about digital surgery, going into a next room talking about how we can better connect with patient vis-a-vis -a, -vis a new application that's giving us insights and the possibility for cures like we never could have understand. And, and these are in difficult diseases, things like hepatitis C, things like HIV. Think about it today, we're on the cusp of cures and they're no longer necessarily a death sentence. So let's reflect on that just a moment. When I started in the industry almost 30 years ago, it was right about the time that HIV and AIDS was first really being understood. At that time, if you were diagnosed with HIV, on average, you probably had two to three years that you would expect to live. Today, and much due to the great work that's been done in laboratories around the world, if you're on the right combination of therapies, it takes about, that same diagnosis will take about two years off the average lifespan. So again, we, we've taken almost a terminal illness and change. Now there's much more work that needs to be done and I can tell you right now that we're working very hard in the labs of Johnson & Johnson uh, and, uh, and our fingers are crossed uh, because we're in the midst of clinical trials as we speak for a vaccine for HIV where we can hopefully move from treatment to actually prevention uh, from it occurring in the first place. And we're very hopeful, but I think those are examples of you know, some of the breakthroughs that are taking place. If you look at public and private landscape, in fact, over the last several years, about $170 billion has been invested in research and development. And uh, while I certainly can't attribute, and you know this very well, causation, I would say there's likely a strong correlation between those events. And even at Johnson & Johnson last year, we were among the top five companies in the world in terms of research and development investment investing in our company alone more than $11 billion. So I think as, as I look at it, I would say our system for innovation does work. It's not without its flaws. Certainly not saying that it can't be improved, but I think there's a lot to be proud of. And again, as I travel around the world, world leaders uh, across the globe Look at the United States with its being a home to more than a thousand teaching hospitals, a hundred medical research centers, just as we have right here, 35% of the patents on new molecular entities. America is truly seen as a gem in terms of research innovation in this important area of healthcare. But I think we, again, we all realize that we've got a lot more work to do. And everyone in this room, I'm sure, and whether you're in business, whether you're in industry or NGOs, administer care and government health towards organization, I think we're all working towards a common goal, and that is how do we improve both the quality, but even now more and more, the value of health care? And that's really the conundrum. How do we bring those two things together in a meaningful way? So let me start here saying that Healthcare is expensive, and the cost growth expected will be quite significant. Now you might say, why do I say that? And some of it starts with pure math. And that is that if you look at CMS figures, total healthcare spending grew about 4% last year to up to about three and a half trillion dollars. And as I mentioned earlier, it's about 18% of our GDP. And that's expected at the current rate if it continues by about 2030 to balloon up to $6 trillion that could be approaching 25% of GDP. And so for a little context, if you look around the world in developed countries, 
The percent of GDP invested by most countries is about 10 percent. If you go to developing markets like China and Brazil, it's about as low as 3 percent. Now, we also face some very uh, daunting prospects regarding demographics. Now, the good news is we're living longer. If you go back to 1960, in fact, and you looked at the average lifespan, it was about 60. Today, it's almost up near 80. At the turn of the century, it was only about 40 or 50. So there have been tremendous advancements. The challenge is we're living not only longer, but we're going to be consuming more health care along the way. So today, we've got about 15 percent of the population that's over the age of 65. That could go as high as 20 percent in the United States. If you live in Japan, by the way, this isn't unique to the United States. If you go to Japan, almost 30 percent of their population is now over the age of 65. In China, the population over the age of 65 is about 175 million. That number is projected to go to about 300 plus million over the next 30 years. So think about that, a population the size of the United States over the age of 65. And the reason that's a challenge is because when we turn 65, that tends to be the trigger for us to start consuming much more significant amounts of health care. In fact, it's about two to five times the amount that you consume prior to being 65, and so the costs rise accordingly. And, um, and so this, this math, so to speak, of an aging population and you know, people consuming more health care along the way due to demographics uh, is certainly one that's going to challenge health care systems, it's going to challenge governments around the world. And by the way, if we compound that with a rising middle class outside, particularly outside the United States, once you have a roof over your head, once you have enough food on the table, guess what the third priority is in terms of consumption or something that you're going to demand more of, and that's health care. And that's why in countries like China, countries like Brazil, where they're currently maybe at 3 to 5 percent of GDP being invested in health care, for social stability, they clearly know that that number will increase, but therein lies the challenge for these governments and health care systems to figure out how that will be paid for. Now, another, I think, important aspect of our health care system is, unfortunately, much of your health today depends on who you are and where you live. Now, I would say that almost wherever you are in the world, and we can be happy to d discuss or take questions or debate this later, when you're ill, there are a few places in the world you'd rather be than right here in the United States. There are many challenges to our system, but when you're ill, and we're very good at providing high-quality, cutting-edge care for those who can afford it. But the heartbreaking reality is, and you ha we have it right here in Baltimore, but we have it in New York, we have it in Philadelphia, and I would say the majority of our urban centers, the gaps between individuals who are living in low-income areas or maybe a zip code or two away can have a very significant impact on morbidity, mortality, on life expectancy, and many other health care factors. And we believe that many of these social determinants of health, they probably attribute almost 50 percent to what your overall health is. And in fact, in 2017, a health affairs study on global health equity, a 32 country study, only Chile and Portugal had wider health care disparities between the rich and poor than the United States. And I think we would all agree it's completely unacceptable. Another large social determinant of health is the way we live our lives. We must realize that in many ways our health care system, it's a reflection of our society. It's a reflect reflection of who we are, the way we live. And by the way, we've got a society that in many ways still doesn't get it right about nutrition, doesn't get it right about exercise, and basically a lot of other lifestyle issues in the way that we manage our daily lives. Think about it for a minute. The rate of adult obesity in the United States has now risen to almost 40 percent. And that's 100 million U.S. adults are living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. And it's not just adults anymore. If you're an adolescent and you happen to be a minority, there's over a 30 percent chance that you could be classified as obese in our country. We walk 15% less than Swedes, 
30% less than the Japanese, and the WHO ranks physical activity as the fourth leading risk factor for global mortality. I think admittedly, too, we're also a society that, look, we struggle with addiction, we struggle with violence, caring for an aging population, especially even death, and doing so with dignity and compassion. And all of these issues, while they're society, societal issues, they ultimately have profound implications in the way they manifest themselves in the cost of health care and the way we deliver care. In fact, lack of physical activity, poor diets, and tobacco use alone drive about 70 to 90 percent of chronic disease. And those chronic diseases, as many of you in, those knows, in this room know who are caregivers, take a huge toll. And they account for about 70 percent of all deaths and about 75 percent of health care costs. And so as we're thinking about how to contain these costs in the systems, it's worth noting that a patient with three or more of these chronic conditions is estimated to cost the system over nine times more than one in a better state of health. So really, we need to, we need to get our hands around these issues now, not only for today, but for the next several decades. So how do we, and I emphasize this, the we, because it's not you, it's not us, it's we, address these issues. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's not going to be easy. But I believe it was John Kennedy said, just because it's hard doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And it's going to take a lot of collective determination. It's going to take a lot of money. It's going to take a lot of grit and guts and expertise. But I don't think we really have a choice. I think we can because we must. And I do believe that there are some themes that we can, we can hold hands and go after that can make a significant difference, uh, and frankly, that we should start doing today. And what I would say is first, it's going to take greater transparency. You know, today, when most people enter into a hospital and receive a diagnosis, it's one of the most frightening moments of their lives. First of all, when the physician gives them the diagnosis, the patient immediately thinks that they're speaking a foreign language. The science is overwhelming. They can't even pronounce the words. They then are quickly given some direction on where they need to go in the healthcare system to help be treated, i.e., well, you need to go to radiology, then you need to go down to oncology, then you need to move over to patient care, a labyrinth that for many of those not used to the system is as complex as a, you know, trying to uh, uh, diagram a microchip. And then you put on top of that the complexity associated with the reimbursement system, it's just downright overwhelming. So having more transparency where patients, consumers, people in the system are more informed and empowered to take a, an active role in managing their health, managing costs associated with it is critical. Number two, it's going to take a combination of partnerships. As I said earlier, none of us can do it alone. Three, it's going to need continued innovation. I mean, if we don't continue to innovate, we won't cure HIV, we won't cure Alzheimer's, we won't cure cancer, we won't cure the next and, you know, epidemic that we face. So it's critical that we continue to, to innovate. And next, I also believe a move towards outcomes and values-based models instead of fee-for-service or activity-based models for reimbursement is critical for success. And last but not least, very importantly, a shift towards wellness prevention. How do we keep people out of the hospital? How do we keep people healthier in the first place? So let's start with transparency. Now, we at Johnson Johnson believe transparency is absolutely necessary, and it's a very positive step towards a more sustainable, long-term system, and one that we think will also deliver greater access to care, definitely at a more manageable cost. Now, we tried to be pioneers in this space. We recently in, published our third uh, annual transparency report around pricing, about how we price our products, uh, the, the different methodologies that are used, um, how, they, how they have evolved on a several-year basis. 
We try to show not only list prices, but net prices as part of a larger effort to explain and to educate everyone about medications that we provide. We also talk about what we do in terms of research and development, and even how we invest in advertising and promotion of our products, so hopefully people can have a better understanding. And we think doing that on a much broader scale across the industry will be much more important to have informed patients and consumers as they bear a larger part of the overall cost of the system. Next, partnering. Look, as I look around this room, there's so many different disciplines and ex areas of expertise that are represented. I think it's only fitting that we talk about how do we work together and not point fingers at each other uh, and, uh, and, and play the infamous blame game. And I think if you look around, there are many examples in different parts of the world, let alone right here in our country, where partnerships and actually working together across the aisle are likely the best path for us to make a meaningful difference going forward. There are examples in Australia and Finland where today, where, whether you're talking about renewable energy, whether you're talking about utilizing artificial intelligence, it's been shown that you can have a real impact, not only on outcomes, but on the economics in a fundamental way. And in healthcare, public-private partnerships have been shown to be particularly effective. Uh, there are many, many examples right here in our own country. Studies in the United Kingdom have shown the public-private partnerships to improve quality, efficiency, effectiveness, access, and achieve overall savings can produce up to 17% compared to areas where you're not seeing these kind of partnerships. You know, today, we're very proud that at Johnson & Johnson, we're working on a number of different partnerships, including with the Department of Health and Human Services Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, also known as BARDA. In this special collaborative model, we share the cost of developing essential technologies and medicines to protect the United States from health security threats. And look, we think this incentivizes research and development in areas where many companies would not venture because of a potential return, but at the same time, this could potentially provide countermeasures for radiation, nuclear threats, and an ongoing project to develop the first flu vaccine to guard against the next potential uh, pandemic. And perhaps the, the highest profile example, of course, that many of you have read about in healthcare today is where companies now are actually banding together in new and unique ways. You've seen the the recently announced partnership between J.P. Morgan uh, and Amazon and Berkshire Hathaway. And I know that these three CEOs very well, and I think they, through frustration, through desire to have a better understanding and ultimately to make a better difference, they're working together. And just between these three organizations, it represents more than 1.2 million employees. They're trying to find simpler, easier, more innovative ways to provide insurance benefits, and to, frankly, negotiate prices, get better value overall for their system. And while I think it's still very early, I think it's actually very encouraging to see these kind of private models, you know, being tried and experimented with to see if it can make a real difference. So I really believe that confronting the social determinants of health requires our most innovative partnering and enlightened cooperation really across the board. And this kind of this collective challenge is ensuring that our fellow Americans can access essential, affordable, and ultimately quality healthcare coverage. And I think we would also agree that achieving universal coverage has got to be our unifying goal. But there's no one-size-fits-all approach. And that's why we support a private public system that includes market-based approaches to assure coverages for all Americans including subsidies to make coverage affordable for everyone. Now our view is that we've got to maintain a vital competitive market that requires guaranteed issues and prohibits discrimination against patients with any pre-existing condition. So as I move next to this issue of new technology and innovation, and the critics might say, well, of course you'd be saying that because you work for a large healthcare company in the private sector, therefore you, you might believe that innovation is going to solve everything. And I would say absolutely not. My wife, who is a nurse for more than 30 years, reminds me that you can bring great innovation, but if we ever lose sight of the patient, 
and the importance of that touch and of care that uh, we should all realize that technology and innovation won't solve everything, but it certainly can make a very important and fundamental difference. And at J&J, &J, well, we're just really not a healthcare company. In fact, more and more, we're a healthcare technology company. And we've got the technology required, as I was mentioning earlier, whether it's in pharmaceutical, medical device, or consumer, to really look across these different domains. And while I'm very optimistic, I also realize that even a company the size and scale of Johnson & Johnson can't take that on alone. It's got to do it with partners. And, you know, one area that we're particularly excited about, and I was having a conversation with Paul earlier, somebody that I had the privilege to work with at Johnson & Johnson is Dr. Bill Height, who many of you may know, who trained at Penn, later uh, worked at R.W. Johnson. He actually led uh, research and development at Johnson & Johnson of our pharmaceutical group and now leads our external innovation site. And one of the things that Bill will, will tell you is that one of the problems we face now is we get to disease way too late. And that whether it's cancer, whether it's Alzheimer's, whether it's orthopedic challenges, that all too often we come in, uh, you know, to use a baseball metaphor, in the seventh inning, when if we would have gotten there in the first or second inning where we could make a difference, it could have a much more significant impact on the ultimate vector or disease progression of that particular condition. And so we realize that more and more getting to patients earlier, coming up with better diagnostics in that process can have a dramatic impact ultimately on how we can intervene and achieve a better outcome. Now one example of a recent collaboration where we're taking this exact kind of approach is a partnership that we're doing with Apple. And I had the opportunity not long ago to sit down uh, with the Jeff Williams, the COO, and Tim Cook, their CEO. And if you look at Apple's strategic objectives, one of their top objectives right now is healthcare. And that's why we're partnering with them actually um, with their iWatch technology. And we know that wearable technology ad, uh, adaptation grew from 9% in 2014 to 33% in 2018. In fact, let me just see a show of hands. How many in here have an iWatch on? Close to a third of the room. So we're pretty consistent in that demographic. And so in working with them, we think that right now, 20% of individuals who experience a stroke were not aware of their underlying atrial fibrillation, which really demonstrates the need for much more sophisticated and ubiquitous screening programs. So together, working with Apple, massively distributed product with our groundbreaking research that we do and insights that lead to a really potential simple and elegant approach that's got the potential frankly, to change the health trajectory for more than 33 million people around the world who are living with AFib right now. And we're working with a host of other partners, uh, also on finding new solutions and how we can detect and do a better job, for example, of treating mental illness. The World Economic Forum recognizes or estimates that by 2030, the global economic impact of mental illness will be more than cancer, diabetes, and respiratory illnesses combined. It's a huge issue right here in the U.S. that really is systemic in nature. And in a partnership between Janssen Research and Toronto-based Winterlight Labs, we're exploring how we can use this new kind of technology with voice samples conducted during clinical trials to non-invasively detect Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative disease long before clinical symptoms may manifest themselves. And we think it's an area of great promise for the future. And although it's in its very early days, the same Dr. Bill Height that I was mentioning earlier is also leading a very exciting partnership in developing new, new tools and detecting lung cancer earlier. So working in collaboration with Boston University, we're developing biomarker-based early screening tests for lung cancer. And through a close partnership with the U.S. Department of Defense and NCI, the National Cancer Institute, we're working with military personnel at risk for lung cancer to understand how different biomarkers might affect different therapeutics and ultimately different outcomes. So now let me move on to this issue of redefining value and how can we change the way that we pay for healthcare. And I think if we're going to talk about improving quality and value in healthcare in the United States, we've got to talk about payment models. 
And specifically, how do we move from this activity-based fee-for-service to a values-based and outcome measure? And again, I fully realize it's hard. It can start with something as simple as defining what is an outcome that we can agree on. But again, I think it's something that holistically we've got to approach. And we're at early stages of adoption, and we know that we've got a long way to go. Uh, and the body of research on the validity of specific alternative payment models is still growing. And again, that's not only here in the United States, but around the world. But it will require us to fundamentally change systems. And frankly, addressing some of the more perverse incentives that come from a model that rewards volume versus the value and outcomes related with tests and services. And what this will mean for all of us, no doubt, from healthcare companies like Johnson & Johnson, but from hospital systems, from payers, from providers to insurers, is we're all gonna have to work together to bring about these changes, and it won't be easy. But if we don't work together to make it happen, there's no way that it can be accomplished. But we do believe that if we succeed, that we can provide better, more efficient, better coordinated care and access. And we think that done in the right way, and scaling adherence to evidence-based medicine, that alone could create almost $315 billion in system-wide savings by reducing unnecessary tests and treatments. So we realize that we've all got a role to play and we're gonna to need to explore new care uh, and methods and we'll need to advocate for change and we're doing that right now at a government level, but I also will be the first one to admit during a very political season, it's not without its challenges. And we'll also need to conduct comparative effectiveness research, something that I know is being done right here at Johns Hopkins. And so again, we have a number of examples where we're giving this a try, but we still have much more work to do. Next, I'd like to talk to this area of shifting to prevention. And I think that this is perhaps the simplest and at the same time, one of the most intractable problems facing healthcare in our country. It's, as we all know, it's really the best medicine. Nothing is more effective, nothing is more efficient than to stopping some of these things from happening in the first place. And look, this has been self-evident since the very founding of our country. I think it was back in 1736 or thereabouts that Benjamin Franklin coined the famous phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I, I don't think there's any better way of saying just how important it is to focus on prevention and wellness and the impact that it can have on reducing the burden on our healthcare system, and frankly, on helping people live longer, healthier, and happier lives. Now, far beyond the cost of the system, up to 40%, think about that for a moment, 40% of annual deaths from the top five non-communicable and chronic diseases are entirely preventable. And that's a tragedy. But I am optimistic that even our entrenched healthcare systems can make the pivot to preventive care that can reduce costs, costs and improve quality. But it's gonna require unparalleled levels of partnerships, and collaboration, new infrastructures, new constructs, and innovative tools for not only earlier intervention but also to support behavioral change. And, and it's hard. There's literally a fitness center on every corner. There's a new diet fad every week and fundamentally changing behavior is no small feat. Now we believe it, it can be done and we've, we've been active in this space for a number of years. In fact, several predecessors before me, Jim Burke, as early as the 1970s, made a, 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 an objective for Johnson & Johnson to be the healthiest company, not only the largest healthcare company, but to be the healthiest company. And we believe in the power of employers stepping up because we live it. It's really one of the greatest points of pride that we have is to have one of the healthiest workforces. More than 90% of our 130,000 employees now have access to programs that actually support healthy living. And it's a trend that's spreading. In 2017, 83% of employers offered incentives for health awareness, programs focused thing on things like physical activity, healthy eating, and other known contributors to avoiding chronic health conditions. And this incentive-based program is one of the best tools we have to really encourage people to take charge of their own health and to get wellness more ingrained into their daily habits, their daily lives, before it leads to illness and disease. 
And I also believe that corporate America that insures about 180 million people, 60% of the population here in the United States, not only has the ability, but in fact, we have a responsibility to use its reach and talent in using our voice to lead change in this area. And another related example that unfortunately many of us don't talk enough about is the rising epidemic of stress and mental related health issues. I was very proud recently, in fact, to join Nancy Brown, the CEO of the American Heart Association, and Brian Moynihan, who's the chairman and CEO of the Bank of America, in collaboration with leaders across the American Heart Association CEO Roundtable to release some research on the most effective ways of improving or helping employers to manage mental health conditions in the workplace and break the stigma that we all know accompanies this disease and has such a dramatic impact on productivity, engagement, um, uh, absenteeism, presenteeism, and other issues that affect our workplaces every day. So let me conclude by saying, look, as I stand here today, uh, sharing some of these reflections on a lot of topics on the transformation of our healthcare system, to hopefully deliver truly new ways of thinking about working with patients. I'm reminded something of a, that a local farm boy, I think he was born just about two miles away from this very spot once said, it was something like this, that the way a team plays together determines its success. You may have the greatest bunch of individual stars in the world, but if they don't play together, the club won't be worth a dime. Now, to truly improve the quality and value of healthcare, we need the entire healthcare ecosystem working together. It calls for radical innovation, but also actionable insight and action. And it's gonna require a great shift to outcomes and value-based care and payment. And it's gonna call for every American to do their part to fully exercise their right and responsibility to good health. But more than anything else, I believe the determining factor of success will be novel cooperation between companies, partners across the entire value chain of private and public insurers, payers, and companies in our country. And only then do I think we're gonna truly capture the life-changing innovation that comes from diverse minds working together that really ultimately have the impact to change the world. And in short, our team needs to play together. So in the spirit of that ultimate team player, Babe Ruth, I'll leave you with this invitation. At Johnson & Johnson, our commitment is to help usher in a new area of access, quality, and value in healthcare, and in doing so, to change the trajectory of health for our country and for humanity. And I look forward to continuing our partnerships and working with you to knock it out of the park. So thank you very much for your time and your interest this afternoon. Just commemorate the event, a nice plaque here for you, and Johns Hopkins tie. Thank so. you very much. Uh, we'd like to uh, open it up for questions. If you would like to uh, ask a question, everyone has a microphone, just hit the button and uh, we can take some questions. Um, you've been talking a little bit about pricing transparency. I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, newly approved therapy for spinal muscular atrophy that has a price of $2.5 million, and whether you think that that's a reasonable price to pay to cure a horrible disease. Yeah, it's a difficult, uh, a difficult question. Um, I, uh, I probably know enough about that particular compound and, and some of the dynamics around it to be dangerous. Uh, but look, I think it's representative of one of the challenges that we have today in that how do we, on one hand, continue to create an incentive, particularly in rare orphan diseases such as this, to come up with game-changing therapeutics that are now possible, uh, but also ensure ultimately that it's done with a price tag that's sustainable uh, and that you know, at the end of the day, not only provides that outcome, but does it with the right value uh, in mind, that does it with the, uh, you know, ultimately the right price to the overall healthcare system. Uh, what I know in this case is that if you look at the number of patients, the numbers of dollars that were put in, the company has, uh, through a number of external objective third parties, 
done some of the, uh, the outcomes research to justify the price, and it was actually done at the lower end of that price. Um, I also you know, realized that it, it, we're in a unique period because many of our current pricing models were frankly built around antibiotics and antihypertensives, and, um, and the type of therapeutics that patients might be on for you know, a short period of time where there were very different price levels versus some of the kind of cures that we're bringing about today. So I think going forward, that's why it's going to be so incumbent upon us to think about new pricing models. Um, you know, one example, and I'll take some risk here. I'm, 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 I don't think I'm being recorded, am I? Okay, I'm not being recorded. In my world, you got to pay attention to that anyway today. Frequently, uh, the, the hepatitis C example is one where the industry was hi highly criticized. And, and I'll start by saying we were one of the first companies involved. And with hepatitis C, prior to the last couple years, as you, you may be aware, available therapies cost about $40,000 a year. You would likely be on your treatment regimen for approximately two years. I think the data would reflect that on average they were about 40% effective. And it, there was a high probability that you were going to have flu-like symptoms, feel significant malaise over that two-year period. And even if you happen to make it through, the chance of you at some point in your life needing a liver transplant were still quite high. The first drug that came out that was approved uh, for hepatitis C, I believe had about an 80 to 85 percent effectiveness rate after approximately a 12 to 15 week treatment regimen. And there was quite a commotion because it was priced at $85,000. And there was a lot of criticism on the part of the industry and, and that's why you may say, well, why are you using that as an example? That's another bad example of the industry. And what I would challenge with is it actually ended up, I think, being an example of why the system works. And let me explain. What quickly happened thereafter is there were about four or five compound, other compounds released into the marketplace. The duration of therapy went from 15 weeks down to about eight weeks currently. The effectiveness rate went up from about 85%, depending on the exact type of hepatitis C that you have, I think is now as high as about 95 to 98%. And the price has now gone down on average to about $25,000 a year. And within, I believe, five years when the first of those treatments goes generic, Literally, for the rest of humankind, you will, we will have a cure for hepatitis Z that will essentially be free. It will be available for generics. So I only tell you that story and that I think it's critical that we maintain a, a system that fosters innovation. I think at the same time, we've got to take out the bad actors, i.e. companies that have a monopoly that distort pricing through illegal means. I think we need to have greater transparency in the system so that people have that understanding. And we need to think very holistically about health care costs. You know, as we make these decisions, uh, you know, regarding what are the lifetime costs associated with some of these diseases, you know, versus a cure. So I realize that's a long-winded, but it's a, it's a complicated question, and hopefully that gives you additional food for thought. You know, the last thing that I would add on to that, uh, while I'm in the, you know, line of fire here, is that... Uh, if you look at overall health care costs, pharmaceuticals make up anywhere between 10 and 14 percent of all of health care costs in total. Yes? Can you comment whether uh, j and does any manufacturing in China or uh, imports any chemicals from China? And also whether you uh, have any, um, you talk about the obstacles about uh, selling pharmaceuticals in China. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, if you would have asked me that question 10 years ago, I would have been giving you a very different answer. And that is that, uh, you know, we found that um, dealing with the FDA equivalent, the SFDA in China, was notoriously difficult. They had built intentional hurdles into the marketplace to, produce, to, to protect local manufacturers. Uh, they had exorbitant requirements about generating local data for Chinese patients before drugs would be approved, which really became barriers for improvement because they weren't willing or uh, desiring to import pharmaceuticals or even other medical devices. We've seen significant change over the last 10 years. 
Uh, they've reduced much of the bureaucracy. It's still a fairly manual process. So it still needs updating. But if you look at the lag now, it used to be as much as eight to 10 years between the time a product would be approved in the United States before it was approved in China. Today, that's gotten down to probably two to four years. So we're encouraged by that. We do have manufacturing facilities in China. The majority of those are for patients in China. In a few cases, you have some devices that may be made in China and re-imported in the United States. None of our pharmaceutical products. You also don't see that uh, with our consumer products either. Uh, there's still, we find, a high desire on the part of Chinese consumers and patients to have products that have been exported from outside China to be used in China, you know, and then particularly when you th see things like baby formula, you know, and, and other medications. We are seeing a pretty significant improvement in the level of research and development that's being done there, however. In fact, we just uh, purchased, or we have a joint venture with a first major pharmaceutical. In fact, it was a, um, a, a CAR-T cell-based therapy for multiple myeloma. And uh, where we actually took that technology, it's in the clinic now. Uh, it holds great promise, again, for potentially bringing about an, a, a path or an approach to a cure in that very difficult disease. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully it's the first of some of the R&D that we'll see you know, coming out of that country. Uh, but that's, that's my overall look at um, you know, the question you asked and, and what I'm seeing take place in, in China. Yes. So, Mr. Gorski, thank you for your lecture. Please, Alex. You can call, my dad's Mr. Gorski. <laughs> it was, uh, I thought, very intriguing, and you touched on some of the very most important points. In the last couple of years, there have been a couple of natural emergencies, hurricanes, that have exposed some vulnerabilities to our supply chain when it comes to some fairly low-cost things, like um, crystal oil, um, EpiPen, insulin, things that aren't huge margin for companies, but become a real problem for consumers and for physicians. Can you just share with us, um, j and J's sort of how you plan to approach that? How do you think the healthcare system in America provide these essential, um, you know, they're not glamorous, they don't have a high margin, you're not going to you know, make millions of bucks on them, but we need them to take care of patients. So what's your approach? What's j and approach to those sorts of things? No, it's a, it's a very important question, and it's certainly something that we've been paying a lot of attention to. I mean, as you can imagine, at a company like Johnson & Johnson, giving the percentage of suture that we're responsible for making for those used in surgical suites every day around the world, if something happened to our manufacturing facilities, it could literally bring sur surgeries to a stop around the world. And so it's, it's a huge responsibility. And so as we look at um, our emergency planning and our backup plans for those various things, whether it's, it's weather, changing climate, whatever uh, the crisis du jour is, uh, it's something, again, that we do a lot of planning for. Um, I must say I was encouraged uh, during the last hurricane in Puerto Rico with the amount of coordination. I think it was a wake-up call for many companies. Uh, we're, the, we're actually the largest employer in Puerto Rico. Uh, and, you know, fortunately, uh, what I can tell you is none of our facilities went offline for anything longer than, I believe, about 24 hours, even... Uh, you know, through the course of that storm. And, uh, and I had a chance to visit shortly thereafter, and I could not have been prouder of our Puerto Rico employees who, even when their families were facing the most challenging hurricane in centuries, they were sleeping in our f factories and our plants to make sure that they didn't lose the power. And the, uh, the corollary of that was in many ways they felt they were fighting for their livelihood because they knew that if they didn't maintain supply, that we could fundamentally question why those facilities were there. And, uh, and, and so as a result of that, and the, the hardening of the facilities, the redundancies that we built in, and this was not only at Johnson & Johnson, but other companies, I think are in a much better position today uh, as a result of that. And I've also got to say I was highly encouraged when um, one Saturday morning in the midst of that, I actually got a call from one of our highest government officials that reached out and said, how are you guys doing in Puerto Rico? I'm getting a lot of government responses. I want to hear what's really going on in the ground. 
And does it, so to have somebody from the government reach out in that kind of a way, you know, I was talking about partnerships, to break through, you know, as, I, as I frequently say, a few things happen when you become CEO, or I'm, I'm sure when you become a high government official. One is the news gets really good or really bad, and the other is your jokes get really funny. And if you're not constantly reaching down several levels and trying to connect and cut through, you know, the proverbial BS, um, you'll get your story. And so I was really encouraged to see that kind of cooperation taking place. And I think at a national level, when it comes to certain levels of vaccines and other medications, the stockpiling that we're seeing done now by the government level, too, is also, you know, a, a dramatic step in the right direction. When I go over here, no, 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 no. yes. Right here. Um, how do you think we as physicians and you as the pharmaceutical industry should respond to the challenges of uh, the epi and price increase, number one, and the oxycontin story, number two? Yeah. Look, I think that, you know, in, in both cases, it's, uh, it's complex. Um, I think in the in the in the EpiPen, and again, we're not we're not in that. So, any response that I'm giving you is predicated upon what I've read and what I understand in the industry. And uh, again, I think part of it starts with our system in making sure that the the way the generic products are reviewed at the FDA is accelerated to and, and facilitates multiple competitors. Uh, you know, in many of these cases, what's, unfortunately what's happened is companies have stepped out because these generic lines, the profit margins are very low. And the more companies that step out means fewer competitors and you ended up developing monopoly. And then when that one, one maker, they then jack the price up. And in making sure that we've got a system that encourages multiple generic companies, and again, I, you might find that strange as somebody running, you know, one of the larger pharmaceutical companies in the world talking for generics. If we don't have generic companies be successful in this country, there's no way that Johnson & Johnson or an innovative company can be successful. Now, what I would argue is that generic companies should follow, should produce the right clinical information. They've got to have high quality, just as we would expect from other companies. And they should follow the rules of intellectual protection, IP. And when they do that, they should be in, on the market. And if we don't have that kind of a release valve, there's no way that we will be rewarded for that next innovation that comes through. And frankly, I think that's the way we sustain ourselves as an innovative company, by having an active, but a fair, well-regulated, generic process. And, and so I think there are several different forms of legislation now that are, are being addressed to hopefully uh, deal with that one issue. You know, as it relates to uh, opioids, I think here too we need to make sure that, you know, we recognize that it, it's a major issue facing our country. I mean, there's not a, there's literally not a family, a person, or a community that hasn't been impacted one way or another. It's how we get the right balance by making sure that we're, we have access to pain medications when it's appropriate, but at the same time it's done in, you know, in a way that's predicated upon the data in an appropriate and responsible way on the part of companies in the broader healthcare system, ranging from the pharmacist to the physician, you know, to the broader healthcare system. And I think that uh, changes that have been made over the past several years are definitely steps in the right direction, uh, but it's something that's gonna take continual monitoring uh, to, to ensure it's done in the right way. Yes? Would you be in favor of legislation yeah, what we would be in favor for is we, the government already negotiates with us. And unfortunately, it's not caught in the headlines. You know, so let me give you an example. When you hear people say that the government is not allowed to take advantage of or be able to negotiate directly, in Part B, Part B price that the government pays is something called average selling price plus 6%. Average selling price means all the discounts that have been negotiated with United Healthcare, with Cigna, with Aetna, with CVS, all of them, that is the price that we end up paying the government. And the 6% is actually to reimburse the provider, the physician, 
or the institution that's administering the drug. So it's a misnomer to say that the government isn't benefiting. But even beyond that, yes, we would be willing to ensure the government could negotiate as long as it's predicated on a free market system, a competitive-based system. What we're not an advocate of is the government setting the price, nor as I think any of us would be across the board in healthcare, uh, where it would be a disincentive for innovation and for ultimately for care to be provided in more effective and more efficient ways. Uh, so I think it's all in the how it actually gets done. And, uh, and so that's what we spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C., trying to make sure that you know, we're educated and informing, and just as I'm sure you do, you know, the healthcare system is unique. It's, it's not like a single receptor, like serotonin, dopamine, or H1 or H2. It's more like a Rubik's Cube. And the minute you turn one cube, you've got 85 other cubes that turn. And that's why we have to work together to do this in a way so that we don't have more perverse incentives or unintended consequences. Yes, sir. Thank you for a very stimulating lecture. Well, thank you. Well, I hope it's not too much of a lecture. I'd rather it be a, a dialogue. Uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were regarding, for instance, the, uh, the time it takes now for a drug to uh, go to discovery to patient side. See an increase in time, an increase in time, especially in the light of uh, the personalized medicine. You focus on population, but rather than you know, set person. Yeah, uh, I think we're going to see dramatic improvement. And uh, gosh, I, I could talk for hours on the innovation side that I was mentioning earlier, but you know, by far the, you know, well, some of the days in my job, the seat can be pretty hot, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, by far the best part of my job is just the range of innovation and technology that I see. And uh, you know, it's not unusual. I can be in, in, walking in one room uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning talking about you know, a T-cell redirection therapy that could potentially have an impact on you know, some type of leukemia uh, or multiple myeloma. I walk into the next room and I'm talking about the next generation digital and robotic surgery. And by the way, I think that's something that will be absolutely ubiquitous throughout surgery over the next five or 10 years. And you know, if I asked all of you in this room, how many of you would get into a car today that didn't have a GPS, that didn't have a beeper, that told you when you were backing up or when you're trying to text and it tells you when you get into the lane next to you? And think about how surgery is practiced and how it's likely to be practiced in the next, that technology is being introduced and worked on as we speak. Uh, it's, it's truly, uh, you know, I was saying earlier, just an intellectual, constant intellectual stimulation by being able to see that across so many platforms. And in one area is this area of drug development. And what I mean by that is we're getting better and better at understanding these underlying biomarkers. And, you know, today, rather than just looking at biology and chemistry as our industry did for decades, now when you overlay the genotype, when you add in the phenotype, when we add in the electronic medical health record, the impact that that has not only on understanding the underlying mechanism, but now when we compound that with RNA, cell-based therapies, you know, ways of stimulating the immune system, we actually now have paths and avenues then to go after those mechanisms, which is very exciting. And so what that enables us to do is have much greater certainty. So today, for example, when we're doing a phase three trial with some of our cancer drugs, we can literally do that trial in 25 patients. Um, we're very hopeful that by using data, cloud, clinical trial systems, and machine learning in different ways, the way we can assimilate data collection during clinical trials will enable us to bring down the number of patients required in dramatic ways. So I'm quite hopeful, actually, in that area that over the next five to 10 years that we're going to see great strides, again, based upon the way we use data, data sciences, and, uh, and apply AI um, you know, in the clinical trial and the drug development process. But it also requires, I got to tell you, if you go to our drug researchers today, in addition to having the best drug, you know, the best chemists and biologists, we've got to have the best data sciences at the same time. So it's building those new capabilities in what we do every day. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more. Yes. 
Uh, thank you for your thoughtful comments. I had um, a comment and then one question. I want to thank Jan Jay for the support that they have given to the uh, future of the nursing profession with their campaign for Nursing's Future, because this is at a near profession changing level right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was, uh, any thoughts on what to do about counterfeit and fake drugs from foreign competitors? Yes. Uh, for, on the first one, I couldn't agree with you more. On, uh, as somebody who's married to a nurse, my sister's a nurse, my niece is a nurse, uh, I know firsthand that uh, there is no more important aspect of our healthcare system than the care that they provide every day. And, uh, and so we are incredibly proud at J&J &J to support the nursing program and uh, you know, make sure that you know, they can continue to progress their careers and, and frankly the impact that they have overall in healthcare. You know, regarding counterfeiting, here too I think technology has got some great opportunities, whether it's through the utilization of RFIDs, uh, through microsensors now that we can actually place uh, in the containers of our pharmaceutical products. Uh, it is going to open up entirely new ways for us to help ensure the safety and the authenticity of our products. It's also something that we have to pay a lot of attention to when we start talking about drug reimportation. And uh, I know politically, uh, you know, that can have a, a, a certain lure to it. Uh, but, you know, we are very fortunate in this country, you know, frankly, to have the kind of protections that we have that can guarantee the safety uh, and the traceability of our products. And uh, before we take like, on something like that, we need to ensure that we know exactly where these things are coming from. So, look, thank you again. You've been a wonderful audience. And... Um, I, uh, I really appreciate the engagement and the discussion this afternoon. Thank you. So again, I'd, I'd like everyone to give Alex. That was an outstanding talk and very frank discussion. So Alex, thank you so much for coming here. We really appreciate it. We have, um, we'll come back at 5 o'clock for the awards and portrait ceremony. Thanks, everyone. So we're pretty consistent in that demographic. And